Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're going to be discussing the clinical prediction rule, or CPR, for a cervical radiculopathy. We're going to be talking about the tests, I'm going to demonstrate them, the logic behind them, the interpretation of the data that comes out of this cluster, and then in the next video, we'll talk about what do you do on day one for an individual with a cervical radiculopathy based on what you find in the examination. This clinical prediction rule was made by Rob Wehner and his colleagues, and for that reason, it's usually referred to as Wehner's cluster. So Wehner's cluster is equivalent to the clinical prediction rule for a cervical radiculopathy. And I'll have the paper linked in the comments of this video, and if you get a chance to take a look at it, it is an extremely well-designed study. Now, before we get into the cervical radiculopathy CPR more specifically, I think it's important to have a good understanding of what in the subjective and objective exam might prompt you to think that there's a possibility that the person sitting in front of you has a cervical radiculopathy. Well, some people would say anytime their symptoms distal to the acromion, which is right here, anything past that, you need to be doing a neurological exam. So testing reflexes, looking at dermatomes, myotomes, et cetera. And I would certainly throw in a few of these tests in there as well. Spurling's test, distraction, nerve tension test. We'll see these in, in just a few minutes. But anytime the patient reports numbness, tingling, some kind of pain that seems to be radiating down the arm, definitely in your interest to perform the tests in this cluster. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen right here, I've got the criteria for a radiculopathy. And this is true of a cervical radiculopathy, thoracic, it's true of lumbar, any radiculopathy. So the person would have to have one of the following. It doesn't need to be all of them, just one. So numbness in a dermatomal distribution, tingling or pins and needles, in a dermatomal distribution. Now, typically when you see these criteria, you just see the tingling part, not the pins and needles. The reason I include that is because remember, just like pain, these changes in sensation are very subjective. So definitely pins and needles, we're gonna include that with tingling and it needs to be in a dermatomal distribution. Also weakness in a myotomal distribution and then also hyporeflexia, okay? Just needs to have one of these. Usually it'll be more than one. Now, interestingly, you do not see on here what most people think of when they think of radiculopathy, whether it's cervical or lumbar, and that is shooting pain, that radiating pain that goes down the affected extremity. Now, certainly that can be debilitating, and it is something we need to take into consideration, but you can have numbness, tingling, pins and needles, weakness, disturbed reflexes, all in the same nerve root distribution, and not have that shooting pain, and it's still a radiculopathy and you treat it as a radiculopathy. So just an interesting note there that you should be aware of. However, even though we have all this good information here, it's not enough. We have to test to see whether the person has a radiculopathy or not, and that leads us into Wehner's cluster. Now there are four tests within Wehner's cluster, and we're gonna go over all of these with a demonstration in more detail in just a minute. But before we get there, I wanna talk about the interpretation of the cluster. So based on how many are positive or negative, what can we say about the individual sitting in front of us? So the tests are as follows. Number one, limited cervical rotation. Number two, Sperling's test. Number three, the distraction test. And number four, median nerve tension test, AKA ULTTA or upper limb tension test A. So there's four tests, you perform them. And then if we look at this table here at the bottom, so over here on the left, it gives us the number of positive criteria, or number of positive tests, either two, three, or four. So if two of the tests are positive, notice the specificity, and this is a pooled specificity for every one of the tests. If there's two positive out of the four, you have a specificity of 56%. Honestly, that's just a flip of the coin more or less. So in other words, if two of these are positive, there's only a 56% chance that the person has a cervical radiculopathy. And if you look at that positive likelihood ratio, it's 0.88, that's terrible. So if you only have two positive tests here, you really cannot conclude that they have a cervical radiculopathy by any means. Now, once you have three of these that are positive, the specificity jumps up to 94%, which is already a lot better. Meaning if three of these are positive, there's a 94% chance that the person has a cervical radiculopathy. And you can see the positive likelihood ratio jumps up to 6.1. Now, realistically, we would love to have a positive likelihood ratio of at least 10. When it's 10, that's the jackpot. Six is still pretty darn good though, okay? But when we have all four of these positive, the specificity jumps up to 99%, meaning there is a 99% chance 
that this person sitting in front of you has a cervical radiculopathy. And that positive likelihood ratio jumps up to 30.3. That's pretty darn good. It's amazing, in fact. So yeah, if all four of these are positive, this is absolutely a cervical radiculopathy. If three of them are positive, you're still pretty positive that they have this, in fact. Okay? And you'll treat this as a cervical radiculopathy. Now, before I demonstrate all these tests, one word of warning. Wehner's cluster is unfortunately not validated. And this is true of a lot of clinical prediction rules. In fact, there's only a small handful of these CPRs that are actually validated. However, like the carpal tunnel syndrome cluster, which is also by Rob Wehner, this one is highly accepted despite not having a validation study. And that is based on how they collected the data. So long story short, and omitting a lot of the details, which you can read about in the paper, which I will have linked in the comments, they had a bunch of people with symptoms that match up with a cervical radiculopathy. And instead of relying on some ridiculous gold standard like an MRI or an X-ray or anything like that, they actually got nerve conduction data. They actually got hard electrophysiological data from the individuals that they were performing these tests on. And it's tough to get any more valid than a nerve conduction study and getting direct electrophysiological data from the same individuals. It's tough to beat that. And because of that, despite not having a validation study, this is widely accepted. So again, you don't have to interpret the results with as much caution as you would another study that did not have such a robust design like that. So again, we take this cluster to be pretty much the word for a cervical radiculopathy in the clinic. Now that being said, let's take a look at the first test, which is really just looking at cervical range of motion, especially rotation. Now the cervical rotation component of this clinical prediction rule, you would have already assessed when you're doing your objective exam, looking at active range of motion of the neck and potentially applying overpressures. But just so you can see it here, let me have you go ahead and rotate your neck to the right as far as you can. And assuming there were no symptoms, I would apply overpressure. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, come back to center. And then go ahead and rotate to the left as far as you can. Is that okay there? Mm -hmm. Any symptoms? All right, I'm going to add a little bit of overpressure. Now, obviously, if there were symptoms of any kind, we would not apply the overpressure. But again, for this particular test, we're looking at having less than 60 degrees of rotation on the affected side. And by affected side, we're talking about the side where she reports any radicular symptoms going down the arm whether that be numbness, tingling, shooting pain, or anything like that. So in other words, if she had left radicular symptoms, a positive test would be considered having less than 60 degrees of cervical rotation to the left. Now, from here, we can go directly into Sperling's test, and this is specifically Sperling's A. So to perform Sperling's A, we are going to side bend the head approximately 20 degrees to one side, and then we're gonna apply an axial compression going down in line with the axis of the neck. And it is only about seven kilograms of pressure, which is about 15 pounds. It's, for most people, a lot less than you think. So apply the compression down, and we assess for subjective reports of symptoms. And then we will repeat that same thing on the other side. About 20 degrees of side bending here, axial compression down, and assess for any reproduction of symptoms. Now, the third test is the distraction test. Now, according to Wehner, how they performed this in the clinical prediction rule, they did this in supine. You are certainly welcome to lay the person down, but since we're already here to be efficient, we're just gonna perform this in the seated position. So when performing the distraction test, we're gonna have our first web space and thumb basically right under the mastoid process on each side and try your best not to cover the person's ears. We're gonna have the head in slight flexion and then we're going to distract upwards. And you might consider holding this anywhere between five and 10 seconds, because if there are ridiculous symptoms, we want to know if they ease or change in any way. Now, as opposed to Sperling's test, the distraction test is an easing maneuver. So sometimes you will have patients with ridiculous symptoms that are present at the time, just sitting there. 
in which case this is a valid test. We would be looking specifically for easing of those symptoms, whether that be numbness, tingling, or shooting pain in the affected upper extremity. However, if the patient comes in and they're sitting right here and they don't have any symptoms, no numbness, no tingling, no shooting pain in that arm, then this test is not valid because there's nothing to ease. Even if it makes their neck feel better, that is not a positive test. A positive test is defined as some degree of easing of any of those upper extremity symptoms on either side. Again, understand the test for the clinical prediction rule was performed in supine. Now, if the person does not actually have any numbness, tingling, or shooting pain, what you can always try doing is getting a grip strength tester, a handheld dynamometer. And sometimes if there's motor symptoms, there may be an improvement in grip strength. So hypothetically, let's just pretend you're holding a grip strength tester on your left side. So go ahead and do that. And let's say it read about 30 pounds of force. And then I would have her relax that. Then we'd put her back in the distraction maneuver. And then go ahead and repeat that grip strength test. If hypothetically that grip strength increased, that would also be considered a positive test. One of the items we're going to look at now is the median nerve tension test, aka ULTTA. The way we're going to do this is we're going to start by depressing the scapula. Now, some people will use a fist like this. That's perfectly fine. My preference is just to put my hand flat on the table and sink that in to depress the scapula. That's going to ensure that it stays depressed because my hand isn't going anywhere. Now, how we go about it from here, there's a number of steps. It doesn't really matter the exact order you do them. The important thing is that you do them the same every single time. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the elbow bent and bring the shoulder up to about 110 degrees of abduction. Some people will stop at 90, that's acceptable, but when you're doing this test, technically it's up to 110 degrees of abduction. Now from here, I'm gonna take her fingers. Now, if you have big hands and you have a small-handed patient, shouldn't be a problem to get all five. If it's the reverse, you're a small-handed PT and you have a big-handed patient, relatively speaking, at least get fingers one, two, and three. Those are the ones that have the largest component from the median nerve, but if you can get all five, even better. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna apply some wrist and digital extension. Next thing, I'm going to supinate the forearm. That means that her fingers are pointed away from her laterally. From here, we're gonna bring the shoulder into external rotation. And then from this point, I'm going to passively extend the elbow while maintaining the wrist and digital extension. And right there, she starts to grimace. That's where she's getting some symptoms, all right? So I stop there, and I make a note of how many degrees of elbow extension I'm at. I don't need to get out a goniometer, but I wanna have an idea where I am because I am gonna compare this to the other side. Now, sensitizing maneuvers. We wanna see how the neck is involved in this and if it's involved at all. So I'm gonna start by having her bend her left ear, in other words, ipsilateral bend, bend her left ear towards her left shoulder. And I ask, does that change your symptoms? And in all likelihood, she will say, yes, it makes them better. Although that won't necessarily be the case. You can bring it back to center. Notice I did not say, does that make it better? We don't wanna put thoughts in their mind. We wanna let them respond. So does that change your symptoms in any way? From here, I can also have her bend her right ear towards her right shoulder. I ask, does that change your symptoms in any way? In all likelihood, she will say, it increases the symptoms. I'll have her come out of that. Again, it may increase symptoms, it may not. Now, what constitutes positive tests here? We've kind of already hit this for the first three in the demonstrations, but we'll reiterate those. Number one, for limited cervical rotation, it is simply having less than 60 degrees of cervical rotation on the same side as the upper extremity radicular symptoms. For Sperling's tests, it is reproduction or increase, if there's already some, of those familiar upper extremity radicular symptoms. For the distraction test, it is easing to some degree of 
familiar upper extremity radicular symptoms. Now, when it comes to the median nerve tension test, there are multiple things that constitute a positive test. You can see three of those there. It does not have to be all three. It can literally just be one of them. Okay, so what constitutes a positive median nerve tension test? Well, the first is obvious, reproduction of familiar upper extremity symptoms. So if you're putting them through those various positions in the median nerve tension test, any of them, it could even be the first one, just simply scapular depression, any of those. If you get reproduction of those upper extremity symptoms, numbness, tingling, shooting pain, that is a positive test. If there is a side-to-side -side difference of greater than 10 degrees in elbow extension, so not necessarily reproducing symptoms, but when you get them eventually in this position and then you are passively extending the elbow, let's say on one side it only goes this far. But on the other side, maybe it's the unaffected side, it goes this far. Well, that's obviously a greater than 10 degree difference in elbow extension. So that would be a positive test regardless of whether or not it reproduces their familiar upper extremity symptoms. Now the last thing here has to do with sensitizing maneuvers. So let's say I have the person in the end range position here. Again, wrist is extended and there's no symptoms yet. And I say, I want you to bend, in this case, your left ear towards your left shoulder. So this is contralateral side bending. Oh, that brings on my symptoms. So even though they didn't have any symptoms here, the fact that I could bend the neck away, which puts more tension on the nervous system, and that brings on their symptoms, that constitutes a positive test. Now remember, if they already have symptoms here, that's already a positive test. You could theoretically have them perform contralateral side bending. We would probably expect that to increase symptoms further. But if they already have symptoms here, that is already a positive test. Now let's say in this position right here, they do have some degree of familiar upper extremity symptoms. If you wanted to be very sure that it is in fact a positive test, you could perform ipsilateral side bending. So in this case, having them bring their right ear towards their right shoulder, that's gonna put more laxity on the nervous system and theoretically ease symptoms. Now, if they already have symptoms right here, that's already a positive test. You're pretty much done. You're just kind of checking that ipsilateral side bending to see if it eases symptoms, because if it does, the person will most likely benefit from a nerve glide that involves the neck. And we'll be talking about that a little more in the next video. Now, one more note here before we conclude this video, and that's on the sensitivities down here in the interpretation box. So these are your pooled sensitivities. Now, as opposed to the specificities, in particularly these last two that are pretty close to one, those are great. But notice that all of these pooled sensitivities are in fact terrible. We want sensitivities to be as close to one as possible. These are pretty far from it. The highest one being 0 0.39, 39%. That being said, this cluster, although it's good for ruling in a cervical radiculopathy, it is terrible for ruling it out. So what do you do to rule it out? Well, it turns out that the upper limb tension test A, the median nerve tension test, as an individual standalone test, has the highest sensitivity. So essentially, if you perform upper limb tension test A and it's negative, you can effectively rule out a cervical radiculopathy. Now, realistically, most people don't just go and perform that test first. In fact, that's usually the last one I do because ordinarily, I already have the person in sitting, so I would have already done cervical range of motion, so the first one, and then I can just quickly do spurlings and distraction. But if upper limb tension test A is negative, it does pretty strongly rule out a cervical radiculopathy. So hopefully this video sheds some light on Wehner's cluster for a cervical radiculopathy. In the next video, we're going to take this cluster and based on what tests are positive, we're going to design a home exercise program that you might give to somebody on day one who has a cervical radiculopathy. So make sure to watch for that video. It'll be coming out over the next week. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.